Namaste everybody, Nachiketa here. We will continue on with the outer body experience, the history and science of astral travel by Anthony Peake. We are on chapter three. <clears throat> the mystery of the near death experience. George Ritchie and Raymond Moody. I have been a professional member of an organization called the International Association of Near Death Studies, IANDS, for nearly 10 years. What attracted me to this association of medical professionals, psychiatrists, psychologists, and enthusiastic lay people was their interest in the phenomenon known as the near-death experience, or NDE. I had long been fascinated by the implications of this curious psychological state that has been reported since records began. For me, the NDE, of if understood in more detail, was a pass possible way in which so-called psychic phenomena may be explained using scientific methods. Many, after many years of reading voluminous amounts of the NDE, I am still of this opinion. Furthermore, I believe that the out-of-body aspects of the NDE are of crucial importance in helping us understand the mechanisms of both phenomena. It is my intention to review the close re relationship between near-death uh, and, in some cases, actual death experiences and the out-of-body experience. I will also attempt to present some uh, counter-explanations which suggest that the phenomenon may simply be a hallucination created by the dying brain. The modern interest in the subject began in the 19, uh, in mid 1960s when a young philosophy student uh, came across a very strange experience reported by a psychiatrist by the name of Dr. George Ritchie. The student, Richmond Moody, was attending the University of Virginia and was sitting with 20 or so others in a seminar, seminar given by Professor John Marshall. The subject of the seminar began being philosophical issues related to death. Marshall told the group about a locally based psychiatrist who had been pronounced dead after a case of double pneumonia and then successfully resuscitated, resuscitated while he was dead. The psychiatrist had the remarkable experience of finding himself outside of his body. Marshall asked, the student what this experience implied about the subjective nature of death. A few months later, Moody had an opportunity to hear Dr. Ritchie describe in person how in 1943, he had been in a hospital in Texas with a respiratory infection. Ritchie explained to the audience that at the time he was 20 years old and an army private, However, he was very excited because he had been selected to train as a doctor at the Medical College of Virginia. Unfortunately, the sudden illness was treating, uh, threatening to delay his enrollment at the college, uh, college the following day, something that really concerned him. As he lay in bed, something started to concern him more. He felt a swift rise in his temperature, and then, to his horror, he began spitting up blood. As he leaned forward, everything went black, but only for a second or so. Richie opened his eyes and discovered that he was laying in a strange bed. Looking around, he found himself in a small, dimly lit, unfamiliar room and immediately assumed that he had fallen asleep, and it was the next day. The day he had to travel to Richmond to enroll, in a panic, he jumped out of bed Fearing that he might miss his train, he looked back and rode, froze. In a stunningly similar situation to my friend who phoned in to my radio programs, he looked back to see a young man lying on the bed he had just vacated. Concerned about missing the train, he turned around and walked into the corridor. As he did so, he was approached by a ward boy. The boy ignored him, which was strange, but what happened next was even stranger. The young man walked straight through Richie and continued along the corridor. Totally shaken, Richie approached another man, a sergeant, carrying an instrument tray and asked him if he had seen the ward boy. The sergeant did not answer or show any sign that anyone was in front of him. Before he had time to evaluate exactly what was happening, Richie found himself outside the hospital 
and flying through the air. Looking down, he w could see that he was still wearing his hospital pajamas. Although quite well designed for a hospital ward, they were totally inadequate as protection from the cold night air. However, Richie felt no sensation of cold, only the feeling of moving very fast. He wondered if he could control his speed and, to his surprise, found that he could. He slowed himself down and maneuvered himself to a soft landing on a street corner near a river. People were walking past him, but just as in the hospital, they looked straight through him. Automatically, he leaned against a thick guy wearing, holding up, uh, uh, thick guy wire holding up a telegraph pole and, and was shocked as his body passed straight through it. He was later to write, in some unimaginable way, I had lost my firmness of flesh, the body that other people saw. His major concern at this time was not how unusual his circumstances were, but that in his disembodied state, a, a career as a doctor would be impossible. He knew that he had to return to the hospital as soon as possible and then hopefully find a way to get back into his physical body. He took to the air and in a flash he was back in the hospital. He had no idea in which ward his body was to be found. He ran from ward to ward, checking the sleeping faces of the soldiers. The night was dim, which made identification really difficult. He then recalled that he owned a very distinctive fraternity ring made of gold and onyx. His search became more and more frantic. He then spotted the ring on the left hand of a body, but to Rich's horror, this hand belonged to a body covered in a white sheet, Cle clearly a very dead body. A young man realized that he, or at least his body, was dead. At that moment, the whole room was filled with an intense light. This was the beginning of the second stage of Rich's NDE. In this play phase, Richie met a being of light that he assumed to be Jesus. This being, after showing him uh, many sights, told him that he had returned to his earthly life as it was not his time to die. In a flash, Richie found himself waking up in this earthly body. To his surprise, he found himself under a white sheet in exactly the same position that he saw himself to be before the being of light appeared. An ordinary, uh, orderly who was been preparing the body for the more noticed feeble signs of life in the corpse and called the doctor. The worried medic then hastily injected adrenaline directly into the heart. This jolted the young man into life, a second life. Although Richie had not taken a breath for nine full minutes, he showed no symptoms of brain damage. The commanding officer at the hospital was to describe the Richie case as the most amazing circumstance of my career and was later to sign an affidavit that George Richie had indeed made a miraculous return from virtual death on that fateful night of 20th December of 1943. The implications of this case fascinated the young Raymond Moody and he decided to ask friends and acquaintances if they had experience anything similar to that reported by Dr. Ritchie, or indeed if they had heard any similar cases, much to his amazement, Moody found that the phenomenon was far more common than he had expected. The reason why it was virtually unreported was because Moody, nobody had asked the question. For the next 11 years, Moody amassed a, a huge collection of first-hand reports similar to that of George Ritchie. Indeed, that amazed Moody. What amazed Moody was just how consistent these reports seems to be. He was sure that he had found something of profound significance. Such was his interest that after teaching philosophy for three years, he decided that although fascinating, it could not give him the answers he sought. He felt that the only way to really understand the meaning behind the experiences was to train as a doctor and test things out firsthand. Moody subsequently completed his degree in Medicaid medicine and was to focus on the psychological, physiological, as well as the psychological aspects of this unusual and unnamed phenomenon. 
after collecting over 150 cases similar to that of George Riches, Riches, Dr. Moody decided to write a book about his finding. The book, Life After Life, was an overnight bestseller. Considerable interest was generated by the, his book, and soon other medical professionals became involved in collecting data and suggesting explanations for this intriguing phenomenon. Although Moody was the first to announce to the world the existence of an experience, others were also working in the same area. One such uh, researcher was Dr. Carlith Otis, and another was Dr. Elizabeth Cooper Ross. However, it was Moody who put first pulled it all together under one readily recognizable term and acronym, the Near-Death Experience, or NDE. From his research, Dr. Moody was able to derive a set of nine traits that, for him, defined the NDE. He made it clear that not all subject experiences all nine, However, some may have only one or two, but at least one must be present for the experience to be considered an NDE. Moody's nine traits are a sense of being dead, peace and painlessness, out-of-body experience, the tunnel experience, people of light, rising rapidly into the heavens, re reluctance to return, a past life review, an encounter with supreme being of light. According to uh, a poster, George Gallup Jr., 8 million adults in the United States have undergone a near-death experience. All of these responding to Gallup's questionnaire. 26% reported the out-of-body uh, sensation. 9% reported the tunnel experience. 32% had had uh, a life review. 23% uh, sensed the presence of another being. What is interesting, but not part of Moody's nine trait, is that 23% of the respondents describe heightened visual perception and 6% claim precognition. Moody's book, backed up by statistics such as those presented uh, by the Gallup organization, was to bring about a considerable amount of interest within the medical profession. Dr. Michael Sabam, a cardiologist, cardiologist uh, was keen to see if he could find any evidence for the NDE from his patients. Sabam was in a perfect position to check this out. He specialized in the resuscitation of patients who had suffered cardiac arrest. Sabam recognized the inherent difficulty of determining whether or not a resuscitated, resuscitated uh, patient had been uh, uh, clinically dead. He carefully defined what criterion he would apply, this was uh, any bodily state in resulting from an extremely psychological, physiological catastrophe that would reasonably be expected to result in irreversible biological death in the majority of instances that would demand urgent medical attention of the 78 patients interviewed by Sabom, 34, 43% reported that an NDE applying Moody's nine traits, the results were interesting. 92% reported the sense of being dead, 53% uh, reported the out-of-body experience, 23% reported uh, described the tunnel of experience, 53% experience, experience rising into the heaven, 100% reported a reluctance to return, 48% uh, experienced a being of light. The other traits not mentioned are individually included within the general definitions. Interestingly, the Gallup survey suggests that 26% of all near-death experiences report an OBE. Michael Sabam's survey uh, elicited an even higher number, 53%. A little-known classic NDE-related uh, OBE was reported by Mormon historian um, Baron S. Hinckley in his book, The Faith of Our Pioneer Fathers, published in 1956, this book describes the conditions and adversities endured by the Mormon pioneers as they crossed the American continent to, file, to found Salt Lake City. In, his, in this book, Hinckley de delves back into the letters and journals of the, these interpret individuals. One such document describes how one of the saints was badly injured by a runaway wagon. Immediately after the incident, the injured man found himself out of his body and looking down from above. His spirit left his body and stood, as it were, in the air above it. He could see his body and the man standing around and, and he heard their conversation. At his option, 
he could re-enter his body or remain in spirit. His reflection upon the responsibility to his family and his great desire to live caused him to choose to enter his body again and live. As he did so, he regained consciousness and experienced severe pain incident, inc incident to the injuries which he had suffer suffered in the accident. It appeared that what we have seemingly consist consistent set of descriptions spanning many years, these people will not have heard of each other, nor is it reasonable to conclude uh, would they have known about how others perceived such an event when at the point of death, this is clearly a significance. Whether the uh, exomatic experience is a com complex hallucination engineered by the dying brain or a genuine out-of-body phenomenon is an open question, but one thing is for sure, for those who experience such sensations, they are very real. The evidence. The historical ca cases in discussed so far have involved subjective experiences of individuals who are close to death in order to collaborate what they saw in their out-of-body states, the experiencers returned to their respective bodies and uh, they and were able to describe their experiences subsequently to witness. However, there is one fascinating historical case in which there was a real death experience. Dr. Joseph Issels was one of the world's leading cancer specialists in his later years he ran a clinical clinic in the small Bavarian town of Ringberg. Although a very controversial figure in the latter part of his life, he ran a very sensitive and caring facility where terminally ill patients were given hope that their disease could be cured. It was one such patient who called Dr. Issels into her room one morning. She del delightedly informed the surprised doctor that she could leave her body at will. Although known for his unconventional views, the idea of out-of-body perception was not something that he believed in any way. Sensing his doubt, the woman smiled and said to him, I will give you proof right here and right now. And now, she told the incredulous, incredulous Issels that he should immediately go down to room 12 and that in the room he should find a woman writing a letter to her husband. She is on the first page, the patient uh, stated, adding that I have just seen her do it. Issels, playing along with her, rushed down to room 12, which was located at the far end of the corridor. Walking into a room, he was stunned to see a woman putting the final words on the first page of a letter. The woman further confirmed that it was a letter to her husband and that she had just started writing in a, uh, it a few minutes before. Issels was amazed by this. He hurried back down the corridor to tell the astro traveler uh, patient that she was indeed correct. On entering the room, he realized that the, between the times he left her room and his return, the patient had died. Was her unusual ability related to the fact that she was about to die? Indeed, what is fascinating about this case was that he that the terminally ill woman did not experience an NDE. Her ability to leave her body was clear, clearly related in some way to her impending death, but was not a part of the death process itself. What is even more intriguing is that this woman claimed that she could induce her out-of-body uh, experience by willing them to happen. However, these cases are purely anecdotal. In case, in recent years, examples uh, what had been termed uh, verticidal uh, NDE-related OBEs have been reported. Uh, by the term verticidal, it is uh, meant that the images and uh, incidents reported by the dying person have been have subsequently been confirmed by others. One of the all-time classic examples of verticidal NDE OBE is much quoted and much analyzed case known as Maria's shoe. In April 1977, a female migrant worker was admitted into Seattle's Harborview Medical Center in 
uh, Washington State, USA. She had sutured a heart attack, so was quickly rushed to the coronary care unit. She was in a very bad way, and three days later, she suffered a second massive heart attack. Fortunately, specialist staff were on hand, and she was successfully resuscitated. Later that day, a social worker called Kimberly Clark called in to check how Maria was uh how Maria was. Maria, although still ill, was very excited and keen to tell Clark that she had experienced a very strange series of sensations while she was unconscious. She described how she witnessed uh, her resusc res resuscitation from a position outside and above her body. Noting printouts following from the monitoring machine measuring her vital signs she then said that she became distracted by something over the area surrounding the emergency room entrance and entrance and willed herself outside the, of the hospital. She accurately described the area surrounding the emergency room entrance, which Clark found curious since a canopy over the entrance would have no would have obstructed obstructed Maria's view if she had simply looked out of her hospital room window. Floating in the air outside the window, she spotted something strange on a third floor window ledge at the far side of the hospital. Again, she realized that she could will herself to another location as she suddenly found herself right next to the object that had caught her attention. It was a man's tennis shoes, specifically a dark blue left foot shoe with a worn out patch over the little toe and a single shoelace tucked under its heel. With this image fresh in her mind, she found herself back in her body as the crash uh, team seemingly saved her life. Clark was fascinated by, the, by this and agreed to try and see if Maria had actually seen something that existed outside her imagination. She walked outside the hospital but could see nothing from ground level. She then re-entered the building and began a room-to-room -room search of the floor above the one where Maria's resuscitation took place, Clark could see nothing even when pressing her head against the window to get a better view. Eventually, and to her great surprise, she did find the shoes. She entered one particular room on the third floor of the north wing and spotted the shoe. But from the vantage point inside the hospital, she could not see the worn out toe which could have been facing outwards or the tucked in shoelace. Later, we shall discover that there is evidence to suggest that these cases are not quite as amazing as they seem when first encountered. Such criticisms have brought about a series of papers and counterpapers presented within these pages of the Journal of Near-Death Studies. In one paper that appeared in the summer of 2007, Kimberly Clark, writing under the married name of Kimberly Clark Sharp, defended her position as reporter of the Maria case, she remains adamant that Maria did see things that it was impossible for her to have known about unless she was floating outside of her body and looking down on the shoe. The major problem with the Maria case is that there is no confirmative information from any source other than Maria herself and the fact that the shoe was found to be in the location that Maria claimed it was. As we shall see later, there have been encounter, uh, counter proposals uh, put forward that the shoe could have been seen either from inside the hospital or from a location outside of the building. Another interesting case appeared in the highly respected medical magazine, The Lancet, in 2001. During night shift, an ambulance brings in a 44-year-old uh, cyanotic comatose man into the coronary care unit. When we go to intubate the patient, he turned out to have dentures in his mouth. I removed these upper dentures and I put them on the crash cart. Only after more than a week do I meet again with the patient who is now back on the cardiac ward. The moment he sees me, he says, oh, that nurse knows where my dentures are. I am very surprised. Then he elucidated, you were there when I was brought into the hospital and you took my dentures out of my mouth and put them onto that cart. 
Uh, it had all these bottles on it and there was this sliding drawer underneath and there you put my teeth. In a subsequent pa paper on this case published in the Journal of Near-Death Studies, Dutch researcher Rudolf H. Schmidt uh, suggest, uh, discusses in great detail how this is a classic case of verti vertical perception during an NDE-induced OBE. The nurse's account was recorded on 2nd February of 1994 uh, uh, by a member of the Merkawa Foundation, a Dutch NDE research organization. In 12 closely tied pages, the nurse gives a very detailed account of what took place uh, that night. In fact, the male nurse found that the patient not only remembered the dentures being placed on the card, but also recounted in great detail conversations that had taken place between the nursing staff uh, the patient described how he had seen everything from a position floating above the nursing staff and towards the corner uh, of the room. However, a very curious uh, co comment was made by the patient in that while he was floating outside of his body, he was also very aware of the presence of pressure, aware of the pressure that his body was feeling as the crash nurse sat on top of it. He described how he felt enormous pain when the heart massage machine was turned on. Although the sense of bilocation could have felt very odd to the patient, the nurse reported that the patient told it so matter-of-factly, so down-to-earth, adding he certainly was not a wooly thinking person. Those fantasies had run wild. The patient was reported as clinically dead when he was brought into the hospital in April 2008, many years after the event. Another member of Murkawa, Titus Rivas, Rivas uh, managed to trace the nurse uh, and asked for further information regarding the incident. The nurse confirmed that the patient had been found unconscious in the field near in the small village of Oi, uh, near Nimmegen. The night had been extremely cold, and on arrival to the, at the hospital, it was reported that he had no heartbeat, no blood pressure, was not breathing, and his body was as cold as ice. It was at this moment, this point, that the dentures were removed, not later when he had started to recover. Clearly, this is a very powerful case, and it does, not ha it does have certain parallels with another that was recorded as part of the Evergreen study, uh, in the NDE phenomenon in 1981 and conducted at the Evergreen State College in Washington State. In this case, a woman who had suffered a ruptured fallopian tube was rushed into an operating room to have an emergency procedure. A member of the medical team involved in the operation was her sister-in-law, a nurse. When the woman came, around afterwards, she described to her in-law that whilst unconscious, she had experienced a very strange event. She found herself outside of her body looking down on the operating room. In a similar way to the Dutch cardiac patient, she was very aware of the events that were taking place below her viewpoints near, ceiling, near the ceiling. She later described the detail what she perceived. I saw this little table over the operating table. You know those little round trays like a dental office where they have their instruments and all? I saw a little tray like that with a letter on it addressed from a relative by marriage she had never she had not met. Unfortunately, the nurse herself was equally sure that there was neither a letter in the operating uh, theater nor indeed a round table. However, it was later reported that there was a small rectangular table in the operating theater. Technically, this was not a table but a stand in that a table was four legs, whereas a stand is on a tubular frame. These small tables are common features in operating theaters and dental practices across the world. The technical name for these devices is a Mayo stand or Mayo stand. Uh, called simply the Mayo by medical staff. It was suggested by the Evergreen researchers that this may have been the source of the patient's con confusion over the letter. It was highly likely that the operating theater staff may have mentioned this stand as uh, part of their discussions. It is reported that hearing is the last sense to shut down before death. 
As such, the patient's subconscious may have heard the word Mayo and perceived it to be a word that would be understood by a non-medical person. For example, a comment like check the mail would have been interpreted as check the mail or something similar. Another case reported in the Evergreen study shows exactly how an NDE-related OBE can involve non-vertical dream elements. After a car crash, a woman found herself out of her body. While then, I remember, not physical body, but like holding hands, the two of us, up above the trees. Uh, was, it was a cloudy day, a little bit of clouds, and thinking here, we go, we are going off into eternity, and then bingo, I snapped my eyes open, and I looked over, and he was staring at me. Here we have the classic OBE sensation after an encounter with death, but Within the OBE is a perception of another person that is sharing the experience. In this case, the other person was also involved in the car crash. And if the evidence of the woman's senses is to be believed, was also floating above the accident. However, this was not the case and her male companion had not even lost consciousness. In his fascinating article, hallucinatory near-death experiences from which I take the above example, writer Keith Augustine suggests that although there are many cases in which hallucinatory elements encroaches into NDE-related OBEs, these cases are rarely reported by organizations such as IANDS or quoted uh, within orthodox NDE books. He argues that this is because in general, most NDE researchers are in the final analysis, trying to show that there is a spiritual and non-materialistic element to the whole phenomenon. Could it be that many, if not all, NDE-related OBEs can be explained in this way, working on the assumption that dreams are a known phenomenon within the present scientific paradigm, and that a good deal of empirical research has suggested that the phenomenon known as sleep paralysis generally generates illusory OBEs, then this is a reasonable position to take as we shall see later. Sleep paralysis may be a clue to a fascinating and challenging neurological explanation for the whole phenomenon. This, is, this will suggest that the whole argument about whether consciousness is located within the brain or somewhere else is simply one of approach. For the time being, the onus of proof has to be has to lie with those who believe that this phenomenon presents evidence that perception can exist outside of the brain, and this is exactly what a series of experiments have endeavored to prove over the last few years. The experiments. The author who first reported the Dutch Dentures case discussed above was Dr. Pim van Lammel, a cardiologist uh, based uh, at Ridge. Ridge Regent State Hospital in Arnhem, Netherlands, Dr. Van Lommel and his associates had interviewed 344 cardiac patients who were successfully resuscitated after cardiac arrest in 10 Dutch hospitals. Out of these patients, 62 reported a, an NDE, of whom 41 described core experience. Van Lamo is one of a new set of NDE researchers who, over the last 20 years or so, have been attempting to find verifiable evidence that the NDE-related OBE is a real, not hallucinatory experience. One of original researchers taking his kind of approach, Dr. Lance Holden, professor of counseling and interim care of the University of North Texas, has now been active in this field for over 20 years. Her first paper on the subject having been published in 1988, this paper reported on the result of a questionnaire that Dr. Holden sent out to a sample of individuals who had reported OBEs with strong visual perceptions while close to death. In response, she received 63 unusual replies. What these responses told her was that OBE perceptions are very clear and detailed. Within her sample, 79% reported that the visions uh, was distorted free, distortion free in color and involved panoramic field of vision. More importantly, 61% claimed that her memory of their memory of the event was crystal clear. This seemed to conflict 
with the suggestion that OBEs are a form of walking or waking dream. Most people report dream state to be confusing, fuzzy, and difficult to remember in any great detail. Indeed, 61% claim that they could read things during their experience. In 1990, Dr. Holden published a paper with Leroy Jostin of Lutheran General Hospital at Park Ridge, Illinois. This was the first recorded attempt in controlled conditions to test whether individuals in near-death states experience vertical perception. Uh, it is clear that death, Dr. Holden and Chaplin Jolston are firm believers in the spiritual explanation of the NDE phenomenon rather than the materialistic, but this in no way cloud, clouded their judgment when evaluating results of their experiment. The experimenters placed visual targets in various locations around the Park Ridge Hospital. These included the emergency room, the coronary care unit, and each room in the intensive care unit. These locations were in the corners of the hospital room, which near-death episodes were most likely to occur in such a way as to be visible only from a vantage point of looking down from the ceiling. No living person was to know the exact content of the stimuli, thus rendering the design double blind. Once the patient was resuscitated from a near-death episode in one of the marked rooms, knowledge of the content of the visual stimuli would be accessed. Assessed. Their not, uh, logic was simple. If a person perceives a genuine out-of-body experience during an NDE, then they would be able to correctly identify the content of the visual target. Unfortunately, only one cardiac arrest took place in the entire 12-month period of the study. To make this even more frustrating, the patient was an Armenian immigrant with little English. <laughs> in 1994, a similar study took place in Hartford Hospital in Connecticut. The hospital's director of nursing, Madeline Lawrence, placed a scrolling LED display high on the cabinet located in the electrophysiology laboratory. This display was not visible to anyone standing up. As Lawrence stated, in order to see this somebody, see this somebody would have to use a ladder or be out of his body. The LED display showed a randomly generated nonsense statement. The plan was that any patient who became unconscious during extra, uh, electrophysiology studies would be interviewed and asked to describe their experience. By the end of the study, three patients had reported uh, the early stages of an OBE-like experience, but none moved far enough away from their body to see the sign. Three years later, a 12-month study was set up in the medical emergency and coronary care unit in Southampton General Hospital in southern England. In this period, boards were suspended from the ceiling of the ward. Written on the ceiling facing side of the boards were various figures. These were not visible from the ground but would be in clear view of a disembodied consciousness floating near the ceiling itself. Of the 63 cardiac arrest survivors during the period, seven reported a level of awareness that after they lost consciousness of these four experienced NDE type prep perceptions, but none reported an OBE. For her PhD th uh, thesis, Penny Chartori of uh, Morrison Hospital in Swansea, Wales, place randomized cards on top of the medical equipment within the resuscitation room of the hospital. This is the place where patients who have suffered a cardiac arrest are worked uh, upon to save their lives because these monitors are above the eye level of a person standing up. They cannot be seen by anyone in the room. Sat Satori's idea was a simple one. If a patient had an OBE while dying during the, a heart attack, it was possible that from an elevated and disembodied position, they would see the cards uh, and hopefully describe them if they had survived the trauma. Sartori ran this experiment from January of 1998 to January of 2003. During the period of her study, Eight individuals reported NDE-related OBEs. None of them reported seeing the cards. According to a paper presented by the uh, psychiatrist, Dr. Peter 
Fenwick at the 2004 IANDS annual conference, this can be simply explained by the fact that during a traumatic NDE, the patient will be more concerned about what was happening to them than spotting cards in odd places. He went on to describe how one experiencer looked at her body, then went out of the window. Another described how she returned to her body as quickly as she could, and a third described how she, he went through a wall backwards for Dr. Fenwick. Each of these circumstances was not conducive to a leisurely viewing of the environment within the resuscitation room. In January 2004, Dr. Holden decided to have a second attempt to finally prove that NDE-OBE perception can be shown to be true. She collaborated with Dr. Bruce Grayson, professor of psychiatry at the University of Virginia, and Dr. J. Paul Malsney, associate professor of internal medicine, also at the University of Virginia. The three researchers had received grant from Portuguese Bai uh, Bial Foundation, the uh, motivation for this research had, was made clear when the three described what they wished to dem demonstrate. Patients during cardiac arrest have perceptions that they could ha not have had normally from the position of their body, as this would provide profound evidence for the independence functioning of the mind while the brain was psychologically impaired. The team decided to study such phenomena during the surgical implication uh, implantation of cardiovascular defibrillator ICDs. These are electrical devices that monitor the patient's heartbeat. If they detect a cardiac arrest, they immediately administer an electric shock to return the heart to a normal rhythm. When these devices are implanted into a patient's chest, the surgeons deliberately induce a cardiac arrest to test the effectiveness and sensitivity of the ICD. When the cardiac arrest is induced, the patient enters a state exactly the same as that experienced during natural heart attack. As such, they may experience an NDE or OBE. Unlike Lawrence's patients, all 25 individuals involved during the period of the study, January, January 2004 to July 2006, experienced at least two cardiac arrests during the procedure. In these controlled conditions, the experimenters had uh, place and open laptop computers on top of either a cabinet or a video monitor. The, this ceiling facing laptop computer was visible only from a perspective far above eye level. The laptop was programmed to generate easily recognized images such as a butterfly floating or a frog jumping and fireworks exploding over the Statue of Liberty. Each image was displayed in red, orange, green, or purple. The computer then followed a sequence of colors and lettering that lasted 40 seconds. During the period of 52 patients were given induced cardiac arrest, five patients acknowledged some recall of event while unconscious, such as a sense of timelessness, feeling of peace, vaguely being somewhere unfamiliar, and possibly sensing the presence of a deceased relative, but nothing resembling a full NDE or OBE. In his paper to the International Association of Near-Death Studies annual conference, Dr. Peter Fenwick discussed why it was that after all these years and many attempts, no clear proof of conscious awareness uh, existing outside the body had been found. Indeed, that is an understa under understatement. As we have seen from our review of the papers, only the Penny Satori uh, experiment reported OBEs taking place in the control conditions. Despite years of experimental time and many cardiac arrests, both induced and natural, no out of body experiences were reported in any of the other studies. But Dr. Fenwick was not disappointed by this. He was sure that the proof of consciousness existing outside of the brain will soon be found. He stated that, in his opinion, the problem was the methodology. With his in mind, with this in mind, he is now associated with another fascinating attempt to finally find his proof. On 11th September 2008, a group of the world's leading researchers in this field met up at the United Nations building in New York entitled Beyond the Mind-Body Problem, the Paradigm in the Science of Consciousness. This symposium announced to the world that a new three-year study had been funded to finally prove 
or disprove the existence of near-death experience related out-of-body experiences. The coordinator of this multinational project would be Dr. Sam Parnia, the physician behind the 1998 Southampton General Hospital research discussed above. In many ways, this project is similar to one organized by Grayson and Holden. Special shelving will be placed in resuscitation area within 25 hospitals across the United Kingdom, the United States, and Europe. These shelves will hold pictures, but these pictures will only be visible from the ceiling. Dr. Parnia had clearly set out exactly what the object of this study will be during the launch of the AWARE or AW Awareness During Resuscitation Study, he stated, if you can dem demonstrate that consciousness continues after the brain switches off, it allows for the possibility that the consciousness is a separate entity. It is unlikely that we will find many cases where this happens, but we have to be open-minded. And if no one sees the pictures, it shows that these experiences are illusions or false memories. This is a mystery that we can now subject to scientific study. Clearly, Dr. Parnia and his associates do not share Dr. Finnick's concern with the methodology. However, it does seem that this is simply doing exactly the same work as Grayson and Holden did between 2004 and 2006. The only difference being that there is much greater public knowledge about the project together with a similarly initiated level of expectation. At the time of the writing this book, November two, 2010, nothing has been reported either in the specialist journals or the general media as to how this project is progressing. I can only assume from the lack of dra dramatic announcements that just like all the other attempts, the AWARE study has drawn a huge zero as regards any scientific evidence for vertical perceptions during a near-death experience. Interestingly enough, this project and all the previous attempts contradicts a long-held assumption that people in out-of-body states can neither read things nor perceive numbers because it is exclusively the non-dominant hemisphere, usually the right, that is active during such events. This has been used many times as a way of explaining why all such experiments set up to prove vertical OBEs have failed. In, such, in using this ex excuse, those who believe that the body and mind are separate entities need to be very careful. A skeptic will, not unreasonably in my opinion, reply that it is not the methodology that is fault as it confirms what many others have long suggested. The, that the OBE is simply an hallucination, a zero return on any of these experiencers. Seeing the cards in the Penny Satori experiments is exactly what such an assumption would suggest. They did not see the cards because they were not outside their body at the time. It would be interesting to see if, I suspect, a similar zero response is reported at the end of the AWARE study. However, there does seem to be one area of evidence curiously uses the absence of sight to prove that the NDE-related OBE is a very real phenomenon, the near-death experiences of blind people. It is to this challenging area that we now turn. The challenge of the blind NDE. All the OBE cases discussed above involve sensory perceptions that is being supplied by an unknown process. How can a person see and hear things when they have no eyes to see or he ears to hear? Indeed, the mystery of how this process works deepens when one considers that there is no physical brain to present this information to consciousness. If vertical OBEs are real, and not simply hallucinatory states, then our understanding of how the brain works is an error. This is not a small error, but something that would demand a radical reassessment of everything we have learned from neurology and physiology. In this scenario, the brain is not the location of consciousness, and even more amazing, consciousness does not need the, a physical body to continue existing. 
modern science will need more than the evidence presented by the subjective experiences in order to test it. As has been stated many times, the plural and anecdotal is not evidence. However, there is one specific area of vertical OBE research that is very difficult to dismiss as hallucination. This involves the near-death experiences of blind people who in the OBE states claim that they can see. The NDE researcher Kenneth Ring identified 21 blind individuals who had experienced an NDE. Of those, 10 had been born blind, 9 had lost their sight before the age of 5 and 2, and 2 were severely visually handicapped. Interestingly, 10 of the subjects claimed that they saw their body below them during the NDE. These 10 all reported the usual moody traits, including the flying down uh, the tunnel towards a bright light, having an encounter with a light being of light. One of the most interesting subjects was the 43-year-old called uh, Vicky Umipeg. Vicky had been born extremely uh, premature and too much oxygen had been given to her after her birth. This destroyed her optic nerve. As a result of this miscalculation, she had been blind since birth. During her life, Vicky had suffered two NDEs. The first was when she was 20 and was brought about by attack of um, appendicitis. However, it was the second that was that is of great interest. She was involved in a car crash when she was 22. In her NDE, she quote unquote saw as she hovered above the hospital bed and noticed that a section of her very long hair had been shaved off. After this was this, she felt herself floating through the roof and then saw street lights and houses below. She then found herself in a field covered with flowers. In this field where people had she had known who were long dead, suddenly a radiant figure walked towards her. She took this figure to be Jesus, although she never identified himself as such. Although he never identified himself as such. This being of light gave her a full life review that she saw in, uh, in color and in great detail. After this, um, being told her she must return in order to bear her children. This greatly excited Vicky because at the time motherhood was only a dream. With this she found herself slammed back into her body and experienced once more uh, the heavy dullness and intense pain of her physical being. What may be of general significance is the fact that Vicky now has three children. This case and the others presented by Kenneth Ring and his co-writer Evelyn L. Elsaeser Valerniero, the researcher who introduced me to Engelbert Rinkler and Dirk Prokel in their book Lessons from the Light, suggests that there is another way in which the mind can process sensory system stimulation that does not involve an embodied brain or an eye. Again. We will discuss the possible explanation for Vicky's fascinating experience in a later chapter. The explanations for cases such as these are needed if our present scientific paradigm is to hold firm. A near-death experience takes place during a particularly stressful and disturbing time. It is not really surprising that in such a statement, usually psychological presumptions manifest Indeed, it has been suggested by some researchers that the whole NDE is simply a brain-generated illusion to help the dying person cope with the distress and trauma. However, the out-of-body experience is not isolated to such circumstances. As we shall discover in the next few chapters, for certain individuals, the popping in and out of soma can become a, a, become a way of life. This was certainly the case for probably the most famous of all astral travelers, American businessman Robert Monroe. It is to his fascinating story that we now turn our attention. Okay, uh, we'll end it there and we'll come back uh, to chapter four. Thank you, everybody. Namaste.